What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be checking out Unexplored 2, which just dropped in full release on Steam. So you may recall that about a year ago, this game hit the ground running on Epic with its early access and it's been developing on over there. We haven't really checked in on it at all since the first release. Well, I spent two or three hours playing the game last night, and honestly, I'm fairly satisfied with what this game is. I think this is one of those RPGs that needs a little bit of a disclaimer on the front end, because I doubt that this game is going to be quite like anything that anybody's ever really seen before. That might be overselling it ever so slightly, but Unexplored 2 is a very odd RPG. So if I had to describe it to people, in most RPGs, you're kind of like Rambo, or you're kind of like, you know, Arnold in Predator. Like, you are a warrior. Like, you are here to kick ass and take names, and like, the asses that you're going to be kicking along the way are always of requisite level to you, but among your peers, you are still like a fighter, a killer, so on and so forth. You are confident in yourself. This game is a little bit different in that regard, in that it's a procedural open-world RPG with a top-down isometric perspective, action RPG elements when it comes to loot and whatnot, but in this game you're more like Indiana Jones. You're an archaeologist. You're an explorer. You're someone that's going down into the deep, dark unknown, and you are a fighter secondary. And so, like, fighting is an option in this game, but fighting is, like, a really bad idea, like, 90% of the time, because typically fighting does not give you much loot, and then on top of that, fighting in this game is actually hideously dangerous, uh, because you are just a man. Like, you're just, like, a human being, effectively. Like, in most RPGs, if you go up against a pack of wolves, uh, you can assume that you're going to trounce them. That's a pretty, that's a pretty common low-level RPG enemy. In Unexplored, that same wolf pack is actually like a real life wolf pack. Like, they can mess you up. They are large, bear sized dogs, and you're a guy with a spear or a sword. You might get like one of them, but like they're gonna do some damage, you know what I mean? And so, anyways, this game is very, very interesting in its premise. And while I do have things I think could have been done, -er, done better about it, I'll wait to talk about those till the end of the video. For right now, we're gonna spend about 30 minutes playing the game, seeing if it's something you're interested in. If after watching this, you wanted to get the game for yourself, it's out on Epic and on Steam. It was on Epic a year ago, now their exclusivity is over, so now it's out on Steam. Uh, and so anyways, link's down there. You can also swing through my Discord and my Twitch stream just in case you wanted to hang out live. But let's play the game. Uh, so I have this one going right here. I forgot that I named him Fart Boy. Now I feel immature. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, anyways, let's make a new world though because you guys probably want to see character creation. The game comes with a number of difficulties, but ultimately all these difficulties are really like starting points because the difficulty is customizable from the ground up. Uh, if we go to standard difficulty right here, basically it will load a preset of options, but you can make your own custom preset of options. So like you can make it so that there are extra like loots and sigils. You can make it so that camping, like you never get attacked while camping and whatnot. Uh, you can make it so that traveling, you get way more encounters and they're way more dangerous. Like, basically, the difficulty in this game is entirely customizable. And, in fact, I think that's a really, really cool modular way to do it. I actually think that the way that they've arranged this, both visually and on a technological level, are very, very smart. I'd like to see this from more games uh, where, basically, you've just got little tiles that you slot in to really get the the content to feel the way you want it to feel. Like, when you've got, like, a list of random options and you just click an arrow to like dial them up and dial them back down. It feels so sterile. I really like this idea. This is a really good idea. Uh, we could also have specific content in here. So this is basically enabling and disabling the tutorial and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've also got random content over here apparently. I don't know exactly what that does. Let's go ahead and randomize our seed. So there we go. And now it's going to build an entire fantasy world for us. That's pretty much it. Uh, we do need to make a new character. I haven't unlocked all the other characters yet. You've got to play the game quite a bit to unlock some of the other characters. Uh, basically, you do diplomacy and stuff because this game is kind of like houses or clans. And they all don't like each other. And by diplomatically joining all the clans, effectively you get new races and new starts for your Wayfarer. But anyways, right now all we really have is the Raffi. Uh, our race of the Raffi, we can be the Groose, 
which are like little bird guys. We can be the Linga Klong, which are like these little guys with bells on their heads. I'm just going to go with the human for right now because it's fastest. We also get to pick our background. You will unlock more backgrounds as you're playing the game. But for right now, we just have the Disciple. Each one will come with varying skills that they start with and that they can possibly achieve, so on and so forth. The game is very sandboxy in that regard. And then our hope traits. So hope is basically kind of this stat in this game where when things go wrong, you lose hope. And when things go right, you gain hope. And if you ever run out of hope, it basically means your character is done. Just like being stabbed with a sword, if your character becomes hopeless, it means that they give up the quest, basically, and they stop working on it. And so basically what you're doing here is you're stacking these. And things that are near the top are going to be the first things that you lose when your hope starts to dip low. And things near the bottom are going to be the stuff that you preserve and the bonuses that you have long term until your run is coming to an end and you've made like a lot of mistakes. I personally really like natural charm and I like, let's say... So this one gives us extra bonuses. I should probably talk about what they do. Uh, basically, we've got a bunch of different options right here. We've got Elemental Insight. Hey, I don't want that. Go back. Go back. I don't want I don't want Elemental Insight. Get out of here. Uh, but basically, these are redraws. This game has kind of like a complex interaction system that has to deal with like cards or dice or tiles uh, that allow you to determine whether or not you succeeded or failed at basic things like lockpicking or social interactions. Uh, you're going to talk with a lot of people in this game. And so I find that natural charm is very, very helpful. Uh, it looks like we can get bonuses with sprites and elementals. We can see things that are hidden easier. We can have less fatigue while we travel. And then we can also get redraws on our magic tests. I'll take that. And then I will probably take endurance, I guess. All right, so now we're on the skills that our character will start with. Like, what kind of stuff can they do? Uh, I like taking empathy because that stacks with my social bonus. So now I have plus two to my social bonus, which is really, really good. It's pretty unlikely that we're going to fail any of our skill tests. Uh, that'll make us more sneaky. We can get better with a shield. Yeah, let's go with shield proficiency. I think that's a really good idea. And then we can ignore a lost on a journey. We can be educated, which means that when we test our knowledge, we'll be better. We can get archery, or we can get better deals in trade. Let's go with knowledge fortune tests. Like, the things your character knows in this game are kind of important. It looks like we can start out with an axe. Actually, we're starting out with all kinds of stuff here, so I guess that's randomized as well. My last run that I played for a couple of hours, I started out with completely different gear than what we've got right here. Uh, we will take the dagger, I guess. I'm probably not going to use it. For right now, I am familiar. Let's do a mace character. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds all right. And I really like the way that the inventory works in this game. But we'll talk about why I like the way the inventory works in this game a little bit later. Uh, the inventory in this game, I think, is actually very elegantly designed. Uh, but there it is. We have our character. And so we will just be splat. Off we go. All right, so we've started out in the town of Haven. It's good. I didn't have to play the prologue. I didn't activate it, but I was a little bit worried it was going to make me go through the prologue again. Uh, but this is where you always start at the beginning of the game. This is basically the hometown for your character. And we start out with the Staff of Yendor. And what the Staff of Yendor is, is the Staff of Yendor is our ultimate quest. We're trying to destroy it, so it's always with us. Uh, everything in this game is tooltipped pretty well. Uh, so, like, it's got the button presses over here that you're going to need in order to do certain tasks. Uh, it does take a little bit of getting used to when it comes to, like, the fighting system and when it comes to, like, the inventory system, but you'll get used to it with time. It'll be fine. F basically draws and undraws your weapons. Uh, people get upset when they see you carrying weapons around town and you might get jumped by the guards. But for right now, like, we really just need to get some starting points to mess around with. Because this is our world map right here, but what you'll notice is the only thing on our randomized world map is really this town and another town over here. We don't know where anything else is. And, like, a big part of this game is just gathering knowledge. That's a huge kind of subtext of the game, is that there seems to have been some kind of precursor race that existed all before the modern races 
and something happened to them and we lost all of their knowledge. And so we live in this world, but we don't know a lot about this world. And we're trying to recover that knowledge so that we can get better at magic and so that we can get better at being civilization, basically. And that's the oh. ultimate goal of the Wayfair. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around town for about five minutes. I'm going to talk to a bunch of people and I'm going to start getting us like some places we can go in order to have adventures. And if anything interesting comes up along the way, like a skill test or whatever, I'll pull you back on in and we'll talk about how that works. But like, there's a lot to cover with this video. So there may be some edits up in here just to make sure that like we're getting to the main meat and potatoes of it uh, without wasting too much time. Actually, I think this is gonna be a skill test right here. I don't even need to make an edit. Excuse me, I gotta be somewhere else with urgency. They prepare, they prepare to move on, keep talking. All right, because we've got social bonuses, we get two free rerolls. So basically, this mini game right here, you approach them cautiously and whisper that you have information they need. Your lips are sealed unless they give you something in return. Uh, basically, you've got a bunch of tiles, and then those tiles go into a bag, and one is drawn at random. And those tiles will determine whether or not you succeed or fail. So the first tile that we drew right here, it adds three successes to the bag. So there you go. Snitches get stitches, so you're risking life and limb to bring them this intel. It won't hurt to give something back, okay? And then we drew a success right there, so we didn't even have to use our social bonus. I'm mighty curious about your tale, but let me tell you mine first. Be very careful when you go into the Laurentian Forest. Recently, I came across a giant purple tree. I heard it was the spirit Dorn. I guess I'm lucky not to be turned into fodder for the fauna of the Laurentian Forest. And so this is basically how you're going to ferret out locations. And so we found, apparently, an opportunity to interact with magic forces over there. Okay, cool. And I'm literally going to go around town and do the exact same thing with everybody in town in order to fill out my map a little bit. And then we'll go on an adventure, okay? So I ran around town for a little bit looking for rumors, and it was fruitful. Everything worked out pretty well. As you can see, our map is now much more populated with things for us to check out. And that's really kind of, I think, the core loop that the game tries to chase down. Is that I find that, like, weirdly enough, the comparison I would make with this game is that it's very similar to Sunless Sea. This is a game about talking to people, listening to people... And if you can't do that, you're never going to find out where all the fun stuff is at to actually go on adventures. It's not a game where fighting and combat are going to be at the forefront. Like, they are a factor. But really, this game is about going into old, unknown places and just kind of seeing what happens on a rumor or on a whisper. And then building up diplomatic relations between towns, unlocking new characters, and all that kind of fun stuff. Now, inside this city for a new player, the places you want to know about is you want to go to the vault over here. Uh, the vault over here is where you drop off knowledge. That's basically the main mechanic to level up your character, is that you find scrolls and books and ancient knowledge, and you donate them to the library, and in return they will teach you secrets. And then over here is the vault. Uh, inside the vault, there is legacy gear. You can actually see that I picked some up. We did not have bracers. Now I have bracers, and they add a little bit of protection. I mean, I may think about selling the bracers, in fact, because with the way the inventory system works, we're a little bit bulky right now. So if we didn't have really much equipment on, uh, all of these slots would be open and we could bring back a ton of loot with us. But because we have this armor right here, our inventory slots actually fill in with that bulk tile right there. There's also small items, so things like rings and jewels and things of that nature that you can carry no matter how overburdened you are. But I actually really, really like this inventory system. I think this inventory system is really good because, like, it factors in weight and it factors in volume simultaneously, like, without you even needing to worry about, like, kilograms or, like, anything else. Like, it's a very, very good system, and I hope to see it in more games. Let me go ahead, and I am going to... Actually, let's see if we can trade this armor away because I don't think the armor is altogether that rare. And so, like, if I can trade it to get something I want, like healing items, I think that that would be, like, a really, really good plan. So let's go talk to the Alchemist real fast. There's a chance he won't buy it. This game has a vibrant economy when it comes to trading. And so different characters want different things. And basically, you barter and trade for just about everything. However, I'm willing to bet the Blacksmith, we can get something out of him if we wanted to do this. And indeed, he will take the armor, so that's good. What can I get in trade, though? So this is well-made and strong. Oh, wow, that actually has a lot. So it's strong. It's plus one protection. It protects against cold for one test. 
extra bulky, so it has another protection, but it adds three to bulk. It has hard, which means it has a 65% chance to cancel seven damage. That's actually a really good chest piece. I didn't actually look at the stats on it, but it's a pretty good chest piece. Uh, right here, he'll improve my mace to make it deal one damage more. It's not a bad idea. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to get a lot out of that uh, out of that chest piece. In fact, there's a good chance we may actually clean out this vendor, like, entirely. An excellent spear. I'll pretty much take, like, all your stuff if you've got it. A light club. I drop the stuff on the ground real quick, and I'll just move things around. How much did we leave on the ground? Uh, we left some stuff on the ground, but honestly, it looks like it was more a function. There we go. I'm going to come back for the spear. Hopefully, it doesn't despawn. Actually, can I get the spear in instead of the dagger? How bulky is the spear? It takes up three inventory slots. Yeah, it's pretty chonky. That is pretty, pretty gnarly. But we did get a bunch of trade goods and a bunch of repair items out of this, which is going to be important. Let me do my inventory management real fast. The beginning of this game is a little bit slow because, like, if you know what you're doing, you're going to be moving a lot of things around and fiddling with a lot of things and trying to, like, basically optimize all the stuff that you have. Uh, this is our general storage over here inside the vault. I'll probably throw the dagger in there. I'll probably throw the sword in there. I will more than likely throw the toolkit in there because I only need one toolkit on me for right now. Your gear has limited uses, and the toolkit allows you to restore those uses. Oh no, dude, the spear despawned when I phased out. Oh man, okay. So anyways, that's kind of a bummer, but I'm not going to cry over spilt milk. We've got adventures to go on. Let's show off the game. I was hoping that it wouldn't despawn when I left the area, but it did. So having journeyed onwards, I've heard rumors that there is a bunch of knowledge inside this keep over here. So I suggest we check that out first, because that's going to allow us to level up our character a little bit. We do have other options, so apparently there's a sigil inside of there, there's a sigil inside of there. Uh, sigils are used for forging in this game, uh, so you can customize your gear and like upgrade your gear and make it better and make it like last longer and make it more sturdy. Apparently there's a haunted barrow over there, but there's no indicator what might be inside of it. I'm guessing treasure. Uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, we'll do this place first. Now on the road, you can see we have an encounter right there with a little question mark. And it looks like it actually used up one of the charges on our boots. So it must've been rough terrain or something like that. Uh, so there's a forge here, there are people here, and there's a shelter here. All right, well, let's go take a look around. I mean, I'm guessing since it's a ruin, there's probably going to be a ladder that goes down deep. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's bad guys everywhere. Fair enough. Let's see if we can't move up that way. Find the treasure hidden in this area, and you'll get a level of daring. Okay. I don't remember exactly what daring does, but, like, having a level of daring would be good. Let me take my weapons out real fast so that I'm good to go. Uh, right click is going to make us block, and then left click is going to make us swing the mace. Combat in this game is a little tiny bit clunky. I can't say that it's, like, my favorite combat. I definitely think that if they had given it some level of fluidity and kind of, like, flow to itself, like something like Fable or something like that, I think it would have been a lot better. And, in fact, I think that the combat is probably going to be the main thing that people bump their elbows on just because the combat's it's like a little tiny bit clunky like your attacks don't really combo into one another like you kind of just take like these big broad swings basically uh, is there anything actually there's a ladder right there that we can go down into but I think what some people will like about the game reach inside the hole sure why not I don't know what that is I think it's just a bird or something I don't know Oh, that one was full of bats. Okay. Well, luckily I was quick on the draw and killed them. And that one is full of some things. I don't know what they are, but I'm going to kill them. They can be dead. All right. So now that we have been victorious over the some things that we could not identify visually. Oh, there's more holes to stick my arm inside of. Sure. Why not, dude? I don't like doing smart things on my adventures. I'm just going to stick my arm inside holes randomly. I don't think those are hostile. It doesn't seem like they're trying to attack me. Oh, we unleashed another one. I still don't really know what those are. 
Occasionally they come out of holes and like alcoves and things like that in walls. And I haven't really determined what they do yet, but that's like the point of the game. Like that's, I can't express that enough is that like, this is not a game that's going to hold your hand or tell you exactly what's going on or what you should do. This is kind of a game that expects you to go, hey, we found treasure. There's a lantern. Nice, dude. And then we've also got a ring inside of there that we can add to our little pile of treasures. Okay. What do we have inside of here? More bats, huh? It's possible the bats might drop some food or something. And honestly, since healing is kind of limited in this game, having some food that we can preserve and cook off is probably not a bad idea. Let's see here. The lock is old and rusty. Even if you had the key, you doubt it would do any good. Okay. So that's locked right there. We can't get in that way. I hear the screeches of angry monsters. I've got a suspicion we're going to have to go down into the spooky hole if we want to get inside the fort. Peace. The gate is barred. You need a lever or button to open it. Okay, fine. Fair enough. And was there anything over here on the left? I don't think we actually went left, did we? Yeah, we did. Right? Did we go left? I don't know. There's probably a way to get up in here. Um, I don't know what those are. Well, luckily enough, they weren't deadly, so I'll take it. Oh, apparently they're like lightning plants or something. Okay. Uh, those things that I picked up are called sparks. Uh, sparks, they allow you to draw another tile from the bag and cancel out the previous one that you drew if you get a bad roll. And so while the game does have RNG in a lot of its situations, the RNG is controllable. If you've got the skills for the task that you're trying to undertake and you've got some sparks, it's more or less guaranteed that you're going to succeed. So, like, don't stress about RNG being implemented too much. I guess we can go down into the spooky cavern. Hopefully there's nothing too bad down here. Alright, spooky cavern. Normally, I wouldn't do this, but since you guys are watching, I'm going to use a lantern real quick. There we go, so now we can see a little bit. Uh, there are hostiles inside of here, so we do have enemies to deal with. These are also traps. Don't step on those. Uh, unfortunately, it bit me. Lame. We lost a little bit of HP right there. I should have known he was going to be hostile. All right, so we took those down. Let's kind of look off to the left over here and just see what's around. And this is really what I like about the game. Like, this game has really big explorer vibes. And I'm an explorer. That's, like, my archetype right there when it comes to Skinner boxes is that, like, I like going into unknown places and finding unknown things that other people don't know about. And, like, we got to sneak past these, I think. But don't step on the roots. If you step on the roots, you're going to have a bad time. There we go. All right, we're good. Uh, it looks like there's something over here. Nope, never mind. Just a little bit of light. If you're wondering how I'm searching like that, there's no real key to do it. Your character automatically searches for anything that might be around while crouched. And you crouch by going into control, which is like your sneaky mode. Uh, there is a tablet over here that we can investigate. An ancient inscription adorns the wall. One glyph indicates hero. You are certain about that. What? Decipher it. Yeah, let's go for it. We get a free reroll because we have a formal education, which is good because we failed. Uh, that one right there, uh, we got a partial success. So now I've got to decide if I want to. Yeah, let's do it. Man, they're just not giving it to me today, are they? The game don't like me. No, no, the game don't. There we go. Let's see. You concentrate as you trace the ancient markings, and you trace them again, and then consult your notebook. You've got it. Now you can read the whole thing. The inscription depicts the burial of an ancient hero with all of their valuables. If you're not mistaken, they're in a barrow. Nice. We found a new barrow. Sweet. And, like, we know that there's something awesome inside of there, so we've got, like, our next treasure hint, too. So we know where to go after this. And that's really kind of the circular format of this game, is that, like, you go out... You have an adventure, you find a bunch of stuff, you take it back to town, you trade it for upgrades and new knowledges and things of that nature. Ow. Yeah, that was kind of painful. I kind of hated every moment of that. What is that wound doing here? Infected. While infected, you were unable to recover health from food. The infection wears off in a day. Okay, that's fine. Let's see if I can sneak in between those right there. Indeed, I did. 
Oh, there's like a little crab monster thing over there. How much HP does he have? I'm gonna smack him. There we go. All right, smack the crab monster. Oh, there was a secret door. All right. I'm guessing that that takes me up and into the temple would be my estimate. Oh, there's a treasure room. We need a copper key in order to get inside of there. Yeah, you can see there's a bunch of loot chests in there and a bunch of knowledge. Okay, so we need to figure out how to get in there. You spot something valuable in the remains. Just there, yours for the taking. An inlaid kith ring. Oh, this is probably not good. Yeah, I'd say that this is probably a situation I'd rather not be in. Uh, let me break out my shield real fast. That way I've at least got some blocking power. And I'm just going to try to stay moving. And we're going to just kind of like put damage on the ones that aren't paying attention to us, basically. Like, if they are aware of us, we are not interested in them. Uh, but this is kind of a hyper-deadly situation that we find ourselves in. And so we'll want to be real careful about this. There we go. We got one of them. Oh, there's another one over there. Oh, good lord. Okay, five damage. All right. Yeah, lots of damage going out right now. Another one down. Another one down. Just keep the shield up. Get off damage where we can. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. Okay. Well, I tried to block that one, but I didn't succeed. We're going to need a health potion. There we go. Health potion. That was our only health potion, though, so we got to be real careful about this. Uh, is at least like the thing that we got valuable? A thin band of silver engraved with a flowing wind pattern. Tradable item of minor value. Eh, Okay, and then it's Flow Rock Inlaid, which means gain one less presence using Flow Magic. Uh, flow Magic is where we break out the Staff of Yendor. Oh, hold up. He's got a magic aura around him. Ow! Okay, I have no idea what just happened. Who are you? What are you doing here? Let's have a closer look at you. Okay, it's like a little bird man. I can't really take a fight right now, so I really hope it's not a fight. We failed the first roll. Okay. We're looking, we're get. our chances are getting better. There's our success. Okay, these guys look like they mean business. You respectfully compliment their presence. Without backing down, you mention how much you respect them and their ways. Judging the delicate balance between showing respect and sucking up, you gently incline your head with hands folded. Nice, okay. We solved this. Just stay out of our way. Are you sure about that? What is this? The statue seems to have a magic presence. Camping in its vicinity is safer. Okay. Fair enough. If you're wondering what presence is, it's this little eye meter down here. As you do things and, like, travel around, this meter fills up, and it it's basically how ostentatious you are. Uh, like, how many people are aware of your existence. And so, anyways, the higher that is, the more encounters and things you get. What's in here? Oh, the forge. Yeah, this is the forge room. Okay, so with this forge room, the way that it works is you put an item. So you put a power source inside the forge. The, that's this thing right here, basically the engine, and that's the fuel. And then you put an item right here, and then you put two more sigils on this spot, and then you activate it, and it'll infuse your weapon and make it, like, magical and make it, like, better. Ah, it's the copper key so that we can get into the treasure room. I'll take that. There's not much, but what is this? Please don't blow me up. Sometimes tiles on the floors do good things. Sometimes they do bad things. And so, like, when they're sticking out like that, I always kind of, like, with one eye closed, like, flinching, I, like, stick my toe on it. And I'm like, eh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't like it here. All right, so uh, let's go back down into the dungeon. I could loot all these bodies for more treasure, but given how the last fight went, I don't feel confident that it's going to go well again. So let's just grab our treasure and get out of here. Getting greedy in this game is like the number one way to get yourself killed. Now, this game does have carried over progress. So stuff that you leave in the vault, uh, for example, carries on to your next character. 
And in addition, if you've unlocked like teleport gates and things like that, those also stay activated. So this game does have a roguelike element to it as well, or at least a metagame progression that exists. What's in here? Uh, we've got a meringue map. Okay. So we can give that to the prime archivist. We've got the mystic's chanting beads. That's actually moderately valuable. We've got a magical ring. So I can actually infuse that ring with a sigil at the forge if I want to and actually make it into like a real magic ring. We've got a map of the first valley. It indicates the exact location of the prime elemental forge. I don't know what that means because I've never gotten that item before in the two or three hours that I've played, but it sounds cool. Thanks to the whisperings from Raph, this is a Raph relic. Give it to the lore master to unlock Courteous as a free unlock skill for all of your future Raffy characters. Nice, dude. There we go. Hell yeah. What else we got? We got anything good? I don't know if I can actually search these scroll piles. Like, I don't know if that's actually, like, a thing. But we do have another treasure chest over here, so I'll go for that. Oh, there's some goodies in here. Uh, we've got a legacy axe. It's a legacy long axe. So we've got an unidentified dark stone ring. Okay. We've got a root sigil. Okay. We've got a flow sigil, so that's good. We've got a wrecked sword. How much space is this going to take up? Four inventory slots? Damn. I really got to get my inventory space up. My inventory space is just, like, miserable, man. But that's a legacy axe. So, like, you want to find that axe right there. If it has the legacy tag, what it means is that if you die, it goes back to Haven and it's always in the vault, basically. And so that's one of those items that flatly just makes your character better from the start because when you make a new character, you can just run over to the vault and grab your legacy axe and be good to go. The other thing is, we know where Clan Wolfmane is, and this is one of Wolfmane's cherished heirlooms that was lost to time. So if we take this to Clan Wolfmane and we give it to them, something good will happen with regards to meta progression. So, like, we will unlock something via that diplomacy and returning to them one of their beloved artifacts from a previous age. And so, like, we really actually kind of want this thing. I already have a toolkit back in town, so I think I'm going to leave the toolkit here. And I can always pick this stuff up now that I have the key. Uh, I can always pick this stuff up really, really quickly because we opened up a pass-through at the top of the temple. So we can come right back to this room and get the loot whenever we want, whenever we need a little bit of a cash infusion, and it won't really be that big of a deal. All right, let's head back to town. We've got some stuff to turn into the Lore Master. We were successful on our first adventure, which I'm very, very happy about. And we've got to hit the road. Okay, let's go back to Haven. Hopefully it's an uneventful trip. My infection is healed. That's good. I'm glad that I'm no longer horrifically infected. Uh, let's go take this to the lore master, and we will drop the axe off with Wolfmane, maybe? Wolfmane's kind of far away. How far away is Wolfmane? Like, if I wanted to take them, their heirloom, where are they at? So that is Clan Sandriders. That is just a dungeon. That's Clan Alzamida, and that's Clan Jabbar. Oh, I guess we don't know. I guess we don't know where Clan Wolfmane is. Okay, so, well, I mean, there's a strong argument to be made, then, that we should wield it. Because it is, after all, a legacy item, and it'll give us a little bit more reach, I think. It is really heavy, which uses up, like, a huge amount of our inventory space, which is kind of a bummer. Because, like I said, inventory space basically determines how much treasure you can bring out of a dungeon. But kind of is what it is. Uh, let's go ahead and we will drop things off at the vault. And I'll decide whether or not I want the axe here in the vault. Is the axe good? It's got a pretty long cooldown on it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's got like a it's got a pretty long cooldown on it. And it looks like the damage it does 7 and the power attack does 12. Our mace does 6 damage because we put the excellent tag on it. So I think I'll just stick with my mace and shield for right now. I think that'll do just fine. 
I do think we should trade off some of these items that we found because we did find a lot of them. I'm going to put my sigils in there, though, so that I can avoid any accidents uh, with, like, accidentally, like, selling them or whatever. I'd rather not. I do need someone to identify that ring for me as well, and I don't know exactly who does that. All right, so let's talk to the archivist inside the library and see what he's got going on for us. I would like to donate items to the library. So we have dropped off several items, so that's good, and now we can learn secrets. I didn't really get that much knowledge for that dungeon, but that was more of a financial dungeon than anything else. Uh, we can learn the location of the Northern Serpent Gate, and apparently it's in a ruin in the Anistan Highlands. Okay. I don't have any knowledge points left, so unfortunately we're not going to be able to go much further. Sorry that I'm kind of tripping through the dialogue rapidly, but I'd much rather be showing off gameplay right now uh, than... I'd rather be showing off gameplay than be showing off dialogue. So I think the alchemist is the next person we need to visit. I need more health potions to, like, guarantee that I can stay alive. Uh, let's trade with him, and let's just kind of see what he'll take in exchange for a healing brew. But healing brews in this game are really, really rare because these get auto-used when you die. And so, like, they basically save you from a death. And so, usually, you're going to have to trade quite a bit to get your hands on it. There's a deal right there. Okay, so we got ourselves a healing brew. That's nice. In fact, we have two healing brews, which is even better. Uh, he does have other potions and various things you can use over here, just in case you were interested in that. I am not, and so I'm moving along. Uh, does the smith have any more, like, modifications he can make? Uh, your weapons in this game do come in different varieties. So there's, like, weak weapons, strong weapons. Make sure you check out the affixes and things that are all over the various weapons uh, because there's some pretty good stuff in there if you know what you're looking for. Like, there's some that can really, really amplify your character's power. Uh, so anyways, we've got lockpicks right there. I don't think it's a terrible idea to carry around a set of lockpicks with us. It would save us the trouble of having to find keys a lot of the time. How expensive are the lockpicks? Oh, dude, they're not even that expensive. Will you take a couple furs for it? No. I'll take a kith ring for it. Sure. Yeah, I'll take the lockpicks right here. Nice. And so now it's time for us to go to... If you ever need to heal, just go to the inn. Uh, the inn over here, they allow you to just, like, hang out and camp for free, basically. I didn't even show you the camping system, but basically anywhere there's an open space you can camp. Uh, what you will see here is that... Which one's the innkeeper? There he is. So we can stay the night right here, or we can buy food from him. Food is primarily how you heal. Uh, and as you can see, this is the camping menu. So we're camping inside of an inn right now. But you can do this, like, anywhere on the world map that you want. There's just a chance that you'll be attacked in your sleep and stuff like that. Uh, so anyways, we can learn a new skill because we leveled up from turning in that knowledge. So we can learn advanced parry. Parry twice in quick succession against weapons of lighter or similar weight. We've got silent steps that will make us better at stealth and also gives us a free ignore visible hardship during our journey. Or we can get better barter deals. Probably go silent steps, I guess. That sounds okay for me. And then we will rest until morning, I think. And they give us a free meal here for staying in the inn. So we'll go ahead and eat some food real fast. And then we will break camp and we're ready to go adventure again. And that's really a very simple condensation of the quest cycle in Unexplored 2. Now you guys missed out on a lot of dialogue and a lot of lore and a lot of world building. I promise that it is in there. This is a very, very foreign game. And what I mean by that is that this is a game where you are expected to feel like a stranger in a strange land. So if you feel disoriented, don't worry about it. That's the point of the game. Uh, my main critiques of the game right now is that the combat is a little bit clunky and I think it could do with like a little bit more fluidity. I think that's the main thing that jumped out at me with the couple hours that I spent with it is I feel like the combat could have had a little bit more flow, a little bit more push-pull, a little bit more momentum to it. But since combat is not really the focus of the game, uh, 
it's not really that huge of a deal. You're not gonna be fighting every single dungeon. You're not gonna be fighting every single place that you go. Fighting is kind of like a secondary thing. Uh, what I will say is that they've done a really, really good job with the art style. I think the game is incredibly beautiful. The soundtrack is fantastic. The world building is quite good as you're going around. I very much like that this is a game about investigation, figuring out where things are at, and then diving down into those places and getting the goodies out of it, bringing it back to town so that the town grows and it becomes more powerful and it becomes stronger. And like you unlock teleport gates and you're doing diplomacy in between various kind of cultures and things of that nature. And the map is entirely procedural. So in an ideal world, there should basically be like endless gameplay here. If you like me are kind of a big time explorer Skinner box guy where you very much just enjoy taking in places and seeing things and puzzling your way through dungeons and, and things of that nature. There's a very, very old school feeling to this game that I think I enjoy quite a bit. I haven't really had any technical issues. I haven't had any problems with like lag. I haven't had any problems with like game crashing or anything else like that. That all appears to be fine. We can take a look at the options menu real fast. Uh, just to see if there's anything in here that's a deal breaker for anybody. Uh, so you can change around the mouse button for your primary hand. That's fine. Uh, keyboard movement assigned aligned to level. You know. uh, auto use healing items. Always good. Looks like we've got a bunch of different other things that we can do here as well, including share metrics, which I'm going to turn off right now because I hate that that's a thing in modern gaming that's always like automatically enabled. It was probably on a box when I installed the game and I was just clicking through thinking it was a EULA. Uh, but anyways, we've got resolution options inside the graphics. We have our display modes. There they are. Uh, cinematic camera or you can have static camera. Screen shake is toggleable. It looks like we have V-Sync on in here in case you're prone to tearing. Visual details. It looks like we mostly just got presets, not a lot of customization there. But anti-aliasing, they do have that in there as well. Uh, anti-aliasing basically smooths things out and makes them look a little bit nicer. It basically gets rid of jaggies, like jagged edges on polygons and things of that nature by taking an average of surrounding pixels. Uh, but anyways, master volume. Sound split, nothing to write home about, standard fair stuff. Apparently there are also cheats over here that you can turn on just in case you need accessibility options. It does look like those things exist over here, so that's nice. Uh, I like it when games have accessibility options that make the game playable to just about everybody. Key mappings, it looks like, are they? They are. They're fully re-key bindable. So there you go. You can move things around all that you want. And it looks like they are all listed here. Fantastic. So anyways, uh, aside from, you know, it's fairly standard fair stuff inside the options menu. Um, I do like the idea of, I've been playing with the cinematic camera, and I might actually try to play with that turned off from now on. Because every now and again, I've noticed that the, cinema, the cinematic camera can gum things up for me every now and again. But yeah, this is Unexplored 2. It's a very unique game, and I don't think it's going to be a game that's for everybody. But I do think that it's definitely a game for somebody, like people that enjoy investigation, people that enjoy reading, people that enjoy going unknown places that are full of darkness and danger and solving puzzles and mysteries and finding lore and knowledge in those areas and learning just bit by bit more about the world and then bringing it back here so that everybody else can learn that knowledge and then leveling up your character. It's a little bit of an intoxicating core gameplay loop and I think the game is pretty rad in that regard. But then again with this one, I think I am the target audience. If you're looking for something like combat heavy or spectacle laden, I don't think that this is going to be the game for you. Uh, this is very much kind of a quiet, contemplative RPG, occasionally truncated by combat. But that having been said, I think it leans into its strengths and it does it pretty well. Really, the actually, you want to know the main thing that I wish this game had? I wish that your gear showed on your character when you equipped it. That was like the one thing. It was the first thing I checked when I started playing. And when it didn't add gear to my character when I equipped it, it bummed me out. Like, it does put the stick and the shield and the weapons on you. But, like, if you take off their boots, like, nothing happens. And, like, if you put on a cape, like, nothing happens. So on and so forth. And so, anyways, uh, I like the game. It's got definitely that feeling of old school sort of heading off into the unknown expedition energy and you might die but there's a lot of stuff to unlock so with this one death is really only the beginning and not really something to worry about too heavily uh, my name is splattercat i sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so that you don't have to today up on the chopping block we had unexplored 2 tomorrow we will have something else thank you for sharing your time with me i know that that is a luxury and most of us don't have enough of it but i appreciate you being here i'll see y'all tomorrow and take care everybody